Hi, yeah, everyone. Um, lovely to be here and lovely to be talking in this session. Um, I have a co-author on this paper, Caroline, who um, isn't here, obviously, but she's here in spirit. And she's also on Twitter, so she's um, actively engaging in the session uh, remotely. So if anyone's got any questions for her, um, then please do get in touch. Um, but the reason why it's a collaborative paper is that I saw Caroline talk at another conference um, and I saw that there was a lot of overlaps between the work, engagement work that she had been doing and the engagement work that I had been doing up in Scotland. Um, and so I suggested, uh, why don't we do a joint paper looking at our different approaches using graffiti to engage with new or different audiences, new heritage audiences. Um, so what's going to follow is a bit of a rapid overview of our projects and as I say we're both around to uh, answer more in-depth questions later. Um, so I suppose we've both been using graffiti as an engagement uh, tool and you know why use graffiti in that way and it's a very tangible heritage uh, to a lot of people who live in urban environments. It's very uh, recognisable, it's familiar, you can sometimes discern um, an individual behind the physical remnants of that individual's interaction with space and place. Um, and it's also quite a great way of bridging sort of traditional concepts of what heritage uh, can be, which can disengage a lot of audiences that we want to work with. Um, and it can bridge it with heritage that is recognisable and it's immediate to the participants that we're working with. And here just um, on the right of the screen, you can see graffiti from a World War II um, air raid shelter <coughs> that we recorded in the Highlands on another project. And it was that picture in particular that was a very tangible link to the people that had um, interacted with that space with the air raid shelter and had left their mark in that way. And certainly our participants really engaged with that particular structure on site because there were physical uh, remnants of the people that had interacted with that site 70 years ago. And I suppose why, why try and do things a bit differently? Well, certainly in the United Kingdom, um, we need to desperately widen our heritage audiences, particularly in community archaeology, which is what I work in full time. Um, we currently have a very fixed demographic, um, who, in, you know, very narrow demographic of who engage with their local heritage. And there's a big push from funders to engage, like widen those audiences. Um, but there should also be a big push from us within the profession to widen our audiences. It's something that we should all be doing. Um, but if we want to engage these new audiences, we need to think about what type of heritage we're using to hook them, to bring them into, into the fold, so to speak. What, what, what heritage can we use to you know, work with them and appeal with them and engage with them? And perhaps by recording an immediate heritage um, is a, a way that can, you know, get them to lead, lead on to engaging with more traditional um, types of heritage that, you know, fit into our frameworks a bit, you know, a bit better. Um, and we've certainly been doing, um, delivering these concepts within the Adopt a Monument scheme. It's a five year scheme uh, facilitated by Archaeology Scotland. Uh, which supports communities to record, conserve and promote their local heritage. And again, there's lots of information on our Archaeology Scotland website about the work of the Doctor Monument, so um, do please go have a look. But a key part of that work is engaging with new heritage audiences, creating outreach projects. We do work with Crisis, Women's Aid, local regional charities. Um, and one of those projects that we did was called Dicty Connect. Um, so Dicti Connect is an environmental based project in Dundee um, and it serves, it basically it's based on the river Dicti and it uses the river to link different communities along that river and so it links very well off areas with very poor areas quite frankly and it's basically they, um, Dicti Connect got in touch with us um, because they wanted to investigate and record the archaeology along the Dicti which hadn't really been recorded before um, so we organised training days, activity days, we worked with a wide range of participants um, and a very big age, um, uh, age, uh, age range within this project as well. And the outcomes are um, from this project quite traditional in that we have produced a baseline record of the upstanding archaeology within the study area and we helped the Dicti Connect basically engage with people, um, get them to engage their local cultural heritage in this way. 
that's just a quick um, map showing the sort of, it's a mill, milling heritage along the Dicty. It's 19th century industrial heritage. Um, and basically a lot of it um, post-war was raised and destroyed. A lot of the substantial features um, were destroyed. So there's only sort of smaller ephemeral features that you can still see. Things like water sluice gates, um, mill lades and things like that. Um, and as I say, we worked with a variety of audiences from a traditional local history group um, to other volunteers, uh, also already associated with Dicty Connect, and Bravey Academy, and it's that particular work that I want to talk about today. Um, so the environmental project was quite keen to engage with this particular school, and the school um, decided that there was a lower tier English cast that could work with us, and quite a few of the children that came out of us um, on site had learning disabilities, behavioural issues, they were excluded quite regularly from site, and they, they had problems concentrating on tasks in hand. I thought they were brilliant and they were hilarious. Um, and we did about five sessions with them, looking at a lot of heritage themes from desk-based assessments. Um, we brought in replica finds, get them to think about ob object handling, uh, storytelling, creative narratives from material objects, um, bringing in their own material objects to create stories out of those. What do those objects tell us about them? You know, all those kind of things about, you know, what, how as archaeologists we tell the stories of the past. But we also obviously wanted to get them out along the Dicty, and we did want to alienate them by forcing them to record sites that we as archaeologists recognised important, but which they felt had very little connection to. So we knew we needed to keep them engaged, so we went out and we recorded graffiti archaeologically. So each tag um, in a particular study and um, sort of area, each tag we encountered was photographed, systematically recorded, um, using recording sheets, handheld GPS, we gave them SLR cameras and they said, you know, go and take pictures, what you think we should be taking pictures from. Um, and yeah, basically let them let them loose on, on, a, on this area. And this is some of the sort of graffiti that we came across. Um, it's quite interesting along the Dickety, there's um, sort of mosaic projects going on and then obviously graffiti artists have then come along and drawn around that or used it in their designs in that way. Um, we haven't found out who Paul is, but the search is still ongoing. Um, and I suppose really, it, as I say, the outcomes from it is that we were able to get them to think about the work of an archeologist within with, with modern uh, materiality. Um, but as with this work was ongoing out on site, we started to hear about the young people's stories of their interaction with the river. Um, so the amount of times that they'd fallen in, particular perhaps arguments they'd had along there, and actually they had noticed the built heritage that was along that site. So a lot of the graffiti we recorded was actually on a Category B listed bridge. That bridge was a meeting point apparently for um, rival estates within Dundee, and the children had stories about that bridge. Um, so it put it in a sort of cultural uh, context. Um, and it was, again, just by going out and looking at more modern materiality, the stories about the um, perhaps the traditional heritage were starting to come out. Um, and also as well, as we started, to, as they started looking at the graffiti tags more in depthly, they then started to take a bit more notice of, as I said, of the features that the tags were printed on. So the 19th century industrial features, as I say, the Category B listed bridge. So again, it's a way of almost sneaking in, getting them to sort of engage with that 19th century heritage by getting them to look at the more modern materiality. Um, I'm doing for time. Um, so... This, um, as I say, we've been doing this work over the last couple of years, and then around about the same time, Caroline, uh, down in Wales, was also doing a heritage graffiti project. And Caroline's project was called the Heritage Graffiti Project. It aimed to help young people involved in offending behaviour to learn key transferable skills by completing a heritage project <laughs> with creative outcomes. Um, so it was completed in conjunction with a youth detention facility in South Wales as part of the wider programme of interventions, um, helping young people get back on track. Uh, get back on track, and it involved Cadu, um, who where Caroline was working at the time as a community archaeologist, a professional graffiti artist, local film producer, and obviously the Mis Ministry of Justice um, facilitated the project through their external tractors G4S. And the activities of the of Caroline's Heritage Project was included um, a series of workshops involving artefacts from a range of periods, 
um, discussing material and function of the objects, um, who might have used them, uh, why have they ended up in the ground or in particular locations, uh, what can it tell us, you know, all of these things, how can we construct narratives about the past through these objects. And by introducing the young people to archaeological um, artefacts, what they meant and what they meant to the people who both created them and used them, themes of identity and community were considered by the participants, along with discussions on our current impacts upon the world through the objects that we use today. And so this body of work was then used as inspiration for a piece of artwork, a graffiti mural. And it's quite interesting in the questions before, Jeff was talking about outcomes of our project. And that's exactly what Caroline's project did. They used graffiti as the creative outcome from the project. Um, so it was gave, um, the graffiti mural gave the young people a chance to express their identities through a familiar, uh, familiar creative response to their heritage. Uh, and in doing so, discussions of merits and problems of graffiti were also incorporated um, within the on-site work. Participation on such a project was treated as a reward for inmates, um, and therefore the project had to be interesting um, in order to be a reward, basically. At some point, yeah, you have to go out and do heritage graffiti. Um, <laughs> so... It was a really great way for participants to gain new experiences, transferable skills, help them build their um, often uh, low self-esteem. And also the participants were given positions of trust in that they were given cans of spray paint and they were trusted to um, use it sensibly and use it to reflect the goals of the project um, and, and things like that. And it became clear again through the course of the project that the things that linked each participant, not only um, were their current positions in prison and the crimes that they had committed, there was also a strong link between the towns that they had come from. And a lot of the towns which, were emer which emerged from the narratives are historically entwined with Wales's industrial past. So Gavatha, uh, Caerphilly, Cardiff, Bertha Tidville. Um, and the mural again began to reflect that past. Um, with the images of pit heads, mines, canals to represent um, the, the 19th century past. Amongst modern icons like the Millennium Stadium, best stadium in the world in my opinion, um, and the, also the backdrop of the Welsh mountains and the Brecon Beacons. It included Raglan Castle, a very iconic castle within Mid Wales, um, images of Owen Glendower, one of the Welsh prin princes, Roman Amphitheatre at Ca Calion, um, and also Pentre Ifan, which um, is the, apparently, I didn't realise this, it's the first scheduled monument within Wales. All well, this about activities, pictures of activities, sorry. Um, and the mural gave them the opportunity to reflect their past, their present, and their future. And the interest from other young people within the detention centre and um, also sort of <coughs> helped create that sort of sense of pride and achievement uh, that it instilled upon the participants. And that's, that's sort of, those sort of outcomes can't be measured by figures and statistics. It's a, a real outcome for the people that took part in the project. And I think both of us, we don't know yet what the lasting outcome from this work or this interaction will be because these people are still young and we need to go back and interview them in 20 years' time to really see what the impact of engaging with heritage in this way is going to be. <laughs> this is why you shouldn't give cameras to young people. Because <laughs> like, you get a whole load of this. <laughs> but... <laughs> but um, both projects, as I say, have long-term impacts, hopefully, on the idea of stewardship of local heritage, appreciation of people's local heritage. And that appreciation can either be through active engagement, i.e. perhaps in 20 years' time they get involved in a heritage project or, or they join an excavation or something like that. But it also can simply be through awareness and appreciation. So they might sign a petition against uh, development because it could impact on cultural heritage in that way. So it's these long-term benefits through these sparks of interaction um, that, may, that may hopefully come out of this work. I think also by engaging with graffiti, you're challenging our participants' perception of what heritage can be. We are very, we have a very traditional idea of what heritage can be, um, certainly when we're doing outreach with the public. And by showing them that graffiti can be heritage, and it is heritage, it is cultural heritage, can get them to start thinking about what other aspects of their lives can be considered cultural heritage, which might become cultural heritage or protected in the future. Um, 
But the difficulty is, is where it sits within our current sort of frameworks. And I think Laura brought this up this morning about the methodologies, sorry, and Alex as well, about the methodologies we're using to recording um, graffiti. Because I think at the moment, we are producing a valuable data set, um, but are, do the HCRs want to, want to have that valuable data set? <laughs> is there room for that data set within HCRs? And there's, there are budget constraints for things like that. Um, and certainly our work within Dickety Connect, I, I mean, I confess our results aren't of the best, best quality. And it's likely that that particular graffiti work is going to be uploaded as an event, as an archaeological event, rather than um, sort of uploading the site record, basically. And I think that's quite an interesting purpose in that it will appear in the record, but it's going to be as an event. Um, and I think that's about it. So I should have left. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>